clean, crisp taste. This Bud's for you. Some people think it's crazy to drive a car over 200 miles an hour. But I'll tell you what crazy is. Crazy is driving any car when you've had too much to drink. So please, don't drink and drive. A reminder from Budweiser. Relive the thrilling and agonizing moments of three decades of ABC's wide world of sports in this exclusive video collection, premiering with the 1960s and continuing through the 70s and the 80s. This is the best of ABC's wide world of sports, available now wherever video cassettes are sold. This is the best of ABC's wide world of sports on video cassette beginning with the 1960s, and Jim McKay was there at the start. Sports, in its unending variety, unfolds on ABC's wide world of sports, capturing the sight and sound, the emotion, the beauty and history-making achievements wherever men gather to compete in this great wide world of athletics. There was triumph for some athletes. Jim Ryan. He's gonna make it, he's gonna run the first four minute mile. It looks like he made it unofficially, 358-6. Valerie Brumel. Oh! Arnold Palmer at the British Open. Par four and break the record by a shot. Hello? And he made it. Great shots on the final hole as Arnold Palmer breaks the record for the British Open. Chuck McKinley at Wimbledon. Yes, Chuck McKinley was the first American man to win since 1955, and no American would win. For, for others, time, there was agony. Oh, oh, Yarborough right out of the racetrack. Did you see the punch? Did you see it? Behind the wall, bouncing back across the straightaway. Boy, only got a couple hundred yards. Great wave as it sends Chuck Sutherland. Plummeting into the air goes. And Wide World continued into their second decade, the 70s. Spanning the globe to bring you the constant variety of sport, the thrill of victory, and the agony of defeat. The human drama of athletic competition. is ABC's Wide World of Sports. There were more triumphs in the 70s, some of the biggest names in sports from around the world, including Pele of Brazil, Olga Corbett of the Soviet Union. No margin for error. Back, some he catch. He did it again. Arnold Schwarzenegger of Austria. And what a physique he has. Vasily Alexia of the Soviet Union. He has the clean. He has it if he can hold it. He does. And the 70s had its share of agony. Wow. What a crash, Pete. I don't think I've ever seen one this bad. Down and he is hurt. Oh, my God. legged and hurt. And Plummet is high. Vinko Bogota's agony would become Wide World's most memorable. And Wide World captured the thrills and agonies of yet another decade, the 80s. Spanning the globe to bring you the constant variety of sport. The thrill of victory. And the agony of defeat. The human drama of athletic competition. This is ABC's Wide World of Sport. Sugar Ray Leonard and Roberto Duran. Now, Leonard is in trouble. That is the so Mary Lou Retton. And that's going to run the front. Round off side aerial. And if you're lucky, you get the a 80s straight. provided Roberto. still more agony. Schrader into the pack. Jeff goes out with him. Allison wins the race. Baker is second. Quick. Uppercut and Marvis is hurt.
relive the thrilling and agonizing moments of three decades of ABC's wide world of sports in this exclusive video collection, premiering with the 1960s and continuing through the 70s and the 80s. This is the best of ABC's wide world of sports, available now wherever video cassettes are sold. I'm Jim McKay at Franklin Field in Philadelphia for the 67th Annual Penn Relay Carnival. Out in Des Moines, Iowa, the 52nd Annual Drake Relays are also underway. And in just a moment, we'll bring you all the excitement and drama of both the Penn and the Drake Relays on ABC's Wide World of Sports. Sports in its unending variety, unfolds on ABC's wide world of sports, capturing the sight and sound, the emotion, the beauty and history-making achievements wherever men gather to compete in this great wide world of athletics. It was April 29th, 1961, and those of us who stood shivering in the damp air of Franklin Field in Philadelphia that day had no idea that we were about to launch the longest running and most successful sports anthology show in television history. Hello, I'm Jim McKay, and that was how it began. A series that was scheduled to last for 20 weeks, a summer replacement show. Well, at this point, it's beginning to look like steady work. When I said that day that we would literally travel the world to document the great sports events, I really didn't know how truly I spoke. In time, we visited 50 countries to record more than 100 different sports. As we've traveled, of course, times and techniques have changed. Black and white television has changed to sharp, brilliant color. Equipment has been miniaturized so that we can put our cameras anywhere, on the roll bar of a race car or the tip of a downhill ski. Still, that first day was quite a technical accomplishment. Two great track and field events, the Penn and Drake Relays, both live on the same program. Also on that day, we focused on the one constant that has characterized wide world of sports through all the years. We focused on the individual human being, in the glare of the spotlight, lonely and fearful inside, poised for the effort of a lifetime. The human drama has always fascinated us, and we'll go anywhere to find it, whether it be Moscow or Vienna, Los Angeles, or a hotel in the Catskill Mountains of New York. The last attempt at seven feet four, almost seven feet four and a quarter. Val Brumel taking off the top of his sweatsuit as the rain begins to fall much harder. It's really bad out here now. And if he wants to get this jump in, he better do it quickly or else that is going to be a sea of mud. The way this rain is coming down right now, it won't take very long. What started out as a beautiful day with the temperature at 85 has turned into a real summer Sunday evening thunderstorm. It happens halfway around the world, just like it does in Kansas or Missouri. There it is. Look at it! Valerie Brumel of Russia has set a new world record in the high jump. And listen to the Russian roar. In January of 62, the World Barrel Jumping Championships debuted on Wide World of Sports from Grossinger's Hotel in the Catskill Mountains. There, Ken LaBelle attempted to become the first man in the world to leap 17 barrels.
For Ken and his wife, this was the moment of a lifetime. They have cleared 17 barrels. Nobody in the history of sport ever did it before. Nobody's ever run the mile in less than four minutes indoors. Watch the seconds clicking off. Beatty is running sensationally here. The man is able to drive himself with no competition at all, and he's really opening up. The crowd is going crazy, Jim. They sure are. The Jim Beatty pulling it on. Here comes the gun lap. Watch him go, turning on the sprint. He's starting up. He's riding right at four minute pace, Jim. He's very good. Close to four minutes. Sensationally close. You may be seeing track history right here and now. He still has about four yards to go. He's going to make it. He's going to run the first four-minute mile. It looks like he made it unofficially. 358.6. What did you get, Dick? According to my watch, 359 flat. No doubt about it. Jim Brady has just run the first four-minute mile indoors in history. This is Donald Jackson of Canada. He's 21 years old. If he's going to win the world championship tonight, he must give the greatest performance of his life. He's given many great ones. He is going to open his program with a triple Lutz jump. Three revolutions from a Lutz position. The first ever done in world competition. Let's see how he does it. He has planned it. Let's see what happens. Here it comes. A beautiful made it. triple Lutz. It's fantastic. You've just seen something that has never happened in world competition before. No man has ever done that maneuver before in the world championships. The Grand Prix of Monaco has been run through the streets of Monte Carlo since 1929. In 1962, Wide World of Sports began its coverage of the event. America's Phil Hill chased Bruce McLaren through the wet streets in the final laps. And here is Phil Hill. He looks about two seconds behind right now. McLaren isn't taking it easy now. He's pouring it on. But his engine may not have any more left than this. Going around the casino turn for the last time. It's Bruce McLaren, 24 years old, from New Zealand, trying to win his first Grand Prix race in Europe. He won the American Grand Prix a couple of years ago, but he's never won one of the big ones in Europe. This is the last turn that he has to make. Here comes McLaren. Watch how close they are. They clip that corner, almost touching the wall. The difference is going to be less than a second and a half. McLaren is across the finish line, and here comes Phil Hill. McLaren is the winner. Phil Hill is in second place. He loses by one in three ten seconds. And what must have been one of the greatest Grand Prix finishes in the history of this kind of racing, Phil Hill has lost to Bruce McLaren by one and three ten seconds, certainly one of the most thrilling sports events that I have ever seen. From Royal Troon in Scotland, we televised a historic British Open Golf Championship. There we saw firsthand a television phenomenon named Arnold Palmer and the new foreign division of Arnie's Army. Well, Nagel made it. Wait a minute. Here he comes. He made it. <laughs> and I hope that that is a mock limp Palmer's putting on as he finally gets up to the 18th grade. <laughs> Squares off with his opponent, and you could not find two more popular men in all of Scotland right now than these two sportsmen from the United States and Australia, Arnold Palmer, Kel Nagel. Should be able to get down in two quite easily. Kind of strong. Oh, my goodness, he got it. Now, Arnold Palmer with about a 20-footer. He could play this pretty safely, lag it up, get his par four, and break the record by a shot. Hello. And he made it. Two great putts on the final hole as Arnold Palmer breaks the record for the British Open by two shots with a total of 276. They really had me doing some strange things in those days. And most of the time, at least, I managed to smile through it all. I believe that mush is the word I was groping for. And speaking of mush, long before the Eagles-Bears NFL Fog Bowl, there was the 1963 Grey Cup in Toronto. Kurt Gowdy reporting in the game he couldn't see. The motion is Caleb. Zuger. On a handoff, reverse. 
Coming wide at the 25, to the 20, to the 15, to the 10 is Henley, and Henley scores! Well, in the end, nobody could see anything, and the game was stopped with a few minutes left to play. They finished it next day. This is where both Swiss sleds crash, but he... Uh, he Ooh. Look out! There he lost it. Well, I don't know whether he lost the man or not, but he's... You see, he's too low on the curve, uh, Jim, and when he, when he came out, the pressure shot him back over to the left again, see? Yeah, he went, went way up high and then plummeted down. Right into the wall, didn't he? The, the, he's dragging the brakeman, I think. It looked to me, and that's bad. I hope he's not, but it looks like it. Yeah, he is. Yes, brakeman right. being dragged by the sled, it looks like. Oh, it's too bad. Too bad. The driver tried to catch his teammate inside and somehow stopped the sled. As it goes back past the finish line again, there's nobody there. Not, those are just spectators leaping down to the course and finally stopping it. And then you see a... Man, the Red Cross, the medical attendant, getting to him now. Claude Brasseur is the name of this brakeman, the poor fellow who was caught there by his foot. The unbelievable and happy ending to this story is that we saw this bobsledder later that same night in an Innsbruck hotel. He had a bandaged nose, a ready smile, and was dancing the twist. Last try, and when in the world do you decide that this is the moment to make that try? Now. Valerie Brunel of the Soviet Union has set another new world record. The first in the world, seven feet five and three quarter inches. In the same meet, we thrilled again to the home stretch heroics of wonderful Wilma Rudolph. There was a special emotion in Wilma's running. One skin tingled when she charged for the tape. That same year at the Women's AAU Swimming and Diving Championships, we met a young girl named Donna Deverona. A quarter of a century later, she would be a fellow commentator at ABC Sports. But on that day, she was out to break the world record of 233 and 3. In second place, in lane six, we have Gina Ambrose, the 14-year-old, but she is a distant second right now. Tremendous gap between Donna Deverona and the other swimmers. Look at that as she comes to the finish line. And watch that clock. It's going to be very close. She may make it. It looks like she's made it unofficially. Unofficially on our clock, you see a 231.7, which would easily be a new meet and world record for Donna Di Verona. 231.8, easily a new American and the fastest record that anybody has ever swum this distance in. Congratulations, Donna. Thank you very much. I think you're just a show off. All you have to do is put, put a television camera on you and you set a new world record. I don't know. <laughs> How did it feel? Okay, can you get any idea when you're out there if you're swimming at a record pace? Well, I usually can tell by how the other, how far ahead I am on the, with the other kids. When it's... We took a look at you from overhead, and you were so far ahead, it looked like they weren't in the same pool. Oh, <laughs> well. <laughs> in July of 1963, we visited the Shrine of World Tennis, center court at Wimbledon. We were the first American network to televise the men's final. We watched Chuck McKinley try to become the first American champion in eight years. Chuck McKinley of Texas. 30, 40. Chuck McKinley stands one point from victory. It's match point. Yes, Chuck McKinley was the first American man to win since 1955, and no American would win for another nine years. the globe to bring you the constant variety of sport, the thrill of victory and the agony of defeat, the human drama of athletic competition. This is ABC's Wide World of Sport. Well, those words have become a part of the American vernacular. But we didn't plan for them to become so well-remembered. As a matter of fact, we scribbled them down quickly in our studio about a half an hour before we were set to go in the air. The opening of our show certainly has changed since that time. If you look closely at the scenes in our opening in those days, you'll notice that the golfer actually missed his short putt. And our skier demonstrated that highly sophisticated technique known as the snowplow. 
But the athletes, the people from the beginning dazzled us, and none more so than a fragile, pale teenager, Peggy Fleming. This is Peggy Fleming, 15 years old from Pasadena, California. The big surprise of this championship so far. She has never participated in the National Senior Championship at all. She never won a National Novice title or a National Junior title. But she's in third place at the end of the school figures and reputedly her free skating is the best part of her repertoire. And I can vouch for that, Jim, because I saw her in practice this morning and she looked terrific. She has all her jumps, she has the power, all she needs now is maturity and a, and a little more experience. You can really imagine four years from now, the 1968 Olympics, she could probably win a gold medal for us. She ends her program with a flying sit spin. Wow, that was really high. What a performance. Peggy Fleming. She has skated the best program so far. I think she'll probably win the free skating. Listen to that crowd. Peggy Fleming participating for the first time in the senior championship. Last year, you were just third in the jun juniors. How do you account for the tremendous improvement in your skating, Peggy? Well, I worked hard this year. You sure must have worked hard. You don't even sound out of breath. I am. <laughs> Here's a young girl you're going to hear a lot more about, Peggy Fleming of California. Thank you. As much as any other athlete, Muhammad Ali meant wide world of sports. He appeared in 27 matches on our show, 10 for titles. We met him first as Cassius Clay, a 10-to-1 underdog to the heavyweight champion, Sonny Liston. He was, from the start, unique and original. Sonny Liston looked at me, I'll kiss his feet in the rain. I'm not out of the rain on my knees. Tell him he's the greatest and catch the next jet out of the country. As a fighter, I think he should be locked up for impersonating a fighter. But that night in Miami changed the course of boxing for two decades. The young Cassius Clay beat the supposedly invincible Liston and immediately changed his name to Muhammad Ali. That dog is still out there. Michael, I don't mean to intrude on your national game, but don't they plan to do anything about that dog? Well, uh, I think they, they'll have to eventually get him out, but as you see, there's no stoppages allowed or anything like that, so they'll have to get him out as easily as they can. Uh, we don't often have things like this happening, but the dog is quite a part of the game at the moment. I think he's trying to get a hold of that ball. And so also is uh, Phil Grimes of Munster there in the dark jersey. This is Pat Cronin of Munster now. Down into the center of the field it comes again. Paddy Moran is puck blocked down. There's Jimmy Doyle again. Jimmy getting and the dog. Jimmy going right through now, taking a nice shot, a high one, and it's gone over the bar for another point there for Munster. This Jimmy Doyle, he's a real sharpshooter. Munster, three points. Leinster, no score. One Sunday afternoon, a group of mountaineers tried to scale the Eiffel Tower in Paris. All told, the Eiffel Tower, which was built 75 years ago, is 986 feet tall. That's to the point they're going to climb. Actually, there's a television antenna on top of that, uh, which makes it 1,048 feet in all. The last thing these men do will be to hang out over the city of Paris with their backs literally facing the street and surmount the final overhang. That will be the most difficult part of the climb. It will come, obviously, when they are most tired. Again, a good look at Paris in the background here. The beautiful buildings of this loveliest of all cities. It's been described as looking like a woman with flowers in her hair. And it does on this spring day. There's the Seine, one of the bridges. Out that way lies Montmartre and Sacré-Cœur. Wide world of sports again scaling new heights. At the National Swimming Championships, we saw Don Scholander, the first great American male swimmer of our time, set a world record and sweep all of his events on his way to a remarkable performance at the Olympic Games. Here comes Scholander. 
another of America's great hopes for a gold medal at the Tokyo Olympic Games. But Roy Sari in lane four hasn't given up yet. He's a body length and a half behind. Seem to be gaining a little bit coming out of that turn. But does not seem to be making up any ground right now. It looks like Scholander all the way. Again, the number to look for on the clock is 158.2. That's the world record. Once again, it's going to be very close. I think he may make it. Scholander's the winner in the unofficial world record time of 157.6. Scholander won four gold medals in Tokyo, the most ever for a swimmer until Mark Spitz. Wide World of Sports was the forerunner of the American sportsman with events well, like the Oklahoma nice rattlesnake hunt. That's just right. Say, that's not a bad little snake. Hey, he's not a bad snake. That'll make pretty good steaks. The rematch between Muhammad Ali and Sonny Liston was one of the most puzzling and controversial fights in boxing history. There was the phantom punch, and the famous long count of referee Jersey Joe Walcott. Well, later we went back and examined that fight with our own clock. Howard Cosell was reporting. Did you see the punch? Did you see it? By the ABC clock, one minute, 53 seconds, was 10 seconds after Liston hit the canvas. Walcott never heard the official knockdown timekeeper. Liston never heard a count. Walcott leaves the fighters. Liston still has reflexes, look at him duck. Now Walcott has gotten information that Liston was down for a count of 10 and more. And so the fight is over and Muhammad Ali is still the champion in a scene of bedlam, chaos, and confusion. Phantom punch or real, long count or not, the Muhammad Ali story continues. Mount Kennedy in Canada was named in honor of President John Kennedy. His brother Bobby scaled it in 65 and later came to our studio to talk about it. Senator, you have said, I think, that you don't care to climb that mountain again in a hurry. However, uh, would you in spirit at least take us back up that mountain with you on these first films that we have? Fine. At this point, did you get any special feeling of the awesomeness, the silence, or anything like that? Well, I think that night you do, particularly in the northern lights come over those tops of those peaks. And then, of course, this is nothing living except ourselves. And there's no, obviously no animals, but there's no bushes and no trees. And it's completely quiet. Got to the last 150 feet were relatively easy. That, of course, is the uh, Kennedy family flag uh, sticking out from the top right, there. Yes. This, Jim Whittaker, Kennedy, Kennedy. this is the moment. This is at the peak. And that is a man named Robert Kennedy who, about as tired, I suspect, as he's ever been in his life, isn't Yeah, it really was tiring. It was tiring. Great men, not simply sportsmen, have been a part of wide world of sports. They faced heights of another kind in Houston that year when what Texans were calling the eighth wonder of the world, the Astrodome, first opened for business. The Astrodome would feature indoor baseball for the first time in history. Rusty Staub and a record-setting home run hitter helped us appreciate just how high was up. Howard was there. Let's bring him in. A man who hit 61 home runs in 61. Roger, just face this camera, if you will. This, of course, is Roger Maris. Rod, you saw Rusty fail. Can you succeed? No, I think I'll fail just as well as he did. Will you try to? <laughs> matter of fact, I might do a better job of failing because I probably <laughs> won't hit the ball. <laughs> Let's try to, Rod. And here goes Roger Maris. Oh! He really flubbed that. He called it a pop-up. Number two as he cautions Blanchard to watch out. Well, that's a good Roger Maris belt to deep right field. One last one. He's going to try it righty. And he hits a line shot to center field. You see, fungo hitting is not easy, is it, Roger? Even for sluggers. That's for sure. I've never had a fungo in my hands before, so I didn't think I could hit one. There's nobody ever going to hit the top of this dome stadium, in my opinion. What about yours, Roger? Not in mine either. It's too high. It's but too it's high. a beautiful place, isn't yes, it? Yes, it is. Very good. Look like he's going to make his move now. Oops, he's Look gotten far enough, far enough up, and those boys are in trouble. Oh! Oh! 
Yarborough right out of the racetrack. We can just see his car tumbling end over end, and that's the last we've seen of it. There's McQuag, who was in the crash with him in number 24. That car's a wreck. Can't imagine what the one outside the track is. But here is that accident again in slow motion. Roger, see if you can see exactly what happened. Well, it looks as though Kalen attempting to pass didn't get far enough uh, up. He didn't get even, in other words. And when he did finally contact uh, the other automobile, right he there. put him sideways in front of him. Then, of course, the two cars sliding together towards the wall and Kale Yarbrough getting up and over. And you can see that car flipping as it goes over the wall. It sure could. In other words, he just, that right front fender got up and it was like a ski jump from there on. That's right. There was uh, Leroy Yarbrough, who also got involved in the crash, losing his trunk lid. And now, here is the unbelievable word, Roger. Kale Yarbrough has been brought back inside the track, and he is okay. Floyd swings on the left. Floyd swings on the right. Look at the kid carry the fight. Floyd keeps backing, but there's not enough room. It's a matter of time. There Ali lowers the boom. Now Ali lands on the right. What a beautiful swing. And the punch lifts Floyd clean out of the ring. And I wouldn't want to really hurt nobody just to please those people out there in the audience. Just for their, uh, I would say, uh, just, just for that pleasure, just hurt another man just outright. Well, aren't you Just telling me in a kind of way that you carried the boy at this point? Well, yes, I'll say yes. Boldly to you here on the nationwide TV that I boxed him. As you see, I'm hitting him with everything in the book, but I just didn't throw it too hard because you would probably be one of the main ones to uh, be on me if the man was hurt seriously. Well, <laughs> boxing is brutal. It needs to be stopped. These fellows are dying should make some type move to stop it. Now here I'm showing you a good boxing match, good art, just whooping the man, and now you want to condemn him for not cruelly killing him. So, in other words, I'm wrong if I do and I'm wrong if I don't. May 4th, 1966, Candlestick Park, San Francisco. Willie Mays coming to the plate to face the clever Dodger Southpaw, Claude Osteen. Well, he's still looking for number 512 of his career. It only takes one pitch, and Willie knows he's got it. He hits to the opposite field with the prevailing win. Number 512 is now in the history books as Willie Mays rounds the bases. New National League all-time home run record. And look at Willie's teammates mob. We want Willie. We want Willie. The chant continues incessantly. And Willie responds. He comes out to doff the cap. Jim Ryan turning it on for the race of his life. Other athletes urging him on. Nobody else within sight of him now. Although, as it turned out, almost unbelievably, Whisaker, who finishes second, actually was under four minutes in this race himself. But here is a sight to remember. Jim Ryan pushing for the tape. And a new world record, three minutes, 51 and 3 tenths seconds, bringing down the world record by a phenomenal 2 and 3 tenths seconds. This is Muhammad Ali, the heavyweight champion of the world, inviting you to stay right there to watch and witness me defend my title against Brian London in London, England over ABC's Wide World of Sports and also it will be on Early Bird Satellite. Thank you very much. The Ali Brian London fight from London marked Ali's second consecutive title defense in that city. And it was only the second live heavyweight title fight on home TV since 1959, the first of which, by the way, featured Ali and Henry Cooper on Wide World of Sports. It was a tribute to his magnetism and charm. Ali had single handedly revived the heavyweight division. Oh, in a tough spot in there. And down he goes. He was in a bad spot in the corner, and he is down. Five, six, seven. Eight, nine, ten, it's all over. It's all over. 
The summer was a strange time for the World Alpine Skiing Championships, but in Portillo, Chile, it was winter time. There we saw Jean-Claude Keeley win his first major downhill victory. In 1968, Keeley, of course, went on to win three gold medals at the Winter Olympic Games in Grenoble. Bob Biatti called it with me. He's off now. He's going to try to cut these turns just as, just as sharp as he can. You can see them right below me here. It's just sort of like driving a race car. How tight do you dare come without sliding out? And Keeley looks very, very good, very tight on these upper turns, carrying his speed very nicely down onto this flat. See him holding his tuck very nicely. Beautiful run. Looks like a fantastic run by Keeley. He's out of my sight now, Jim. Bob Keeley has a sensational intermediate time, 58.22 seconds. If he can keep that up, he's going to be tough to beat. Of course, this is not his premier event. He's usually much stronger in the giant slalom than the slalom. Keeley, who very often almost looks as if he's skiing out of control, but almost never is. Still looking just right as he comes down this course. Still to come is that bump near the end. Don't forget that. And here it comes. Right now. Uh, almost losing it, but a tremendous typical Jean-Claude Keeley recovery. Into the eighth position and under the finish banner. Keeley with a time of... 134.40, sensational time, and that is going to be tough to beat. John Clarkini in first place. The first racer on the course is Nancy Green of Canada, and after her disappointment in the slalom, she's really going flat out. And Jim, one thing to remember here is that the women will be racing on the same course as the men. The top is going to be slow, but remember, they still have that tough bump at the bottom. Right here. Look out, Nancy, out of control, smashing into the wall. Bob, this looks bad. Right after Walt Fox falling the men downhill, now suddenly we have another bad one. Nancy seems to be moving, but she really hit that about as hard as I've ever seen anybody. It was a terrible crash for Canada's Nancy Green, one of the favorites at those world championships in Chile. But the very next year, Green joined Jean-Claude Keeley as the first overall World Cup champions on that newly formed world ski racing circuit. Huntington Beach, California, with its warm weather and beautiful ocean side, is a scenic setting for any sport. But in 1966, Huntington Beach acquired its first real notoriety when dory boat racing came to town. What's dory boat racing? Take a look. That boat did a complete flip, and down it goes. That was a second place boat, by the way, and the fellows are going to swim on into shore. Over the falls. Look at this. Fantastic. They're headed towards the pier. They're both in the bottom of the boat, and they hit the pier. And that boat has completely broken apart, just smashed by tons of water into those concrete pilings. The boys are okay. I see both of them there. I think they better get out of the way of that piling before the next wave hits because the set's still coming. Fantastic. Look at that. It flew apart like a matchbox. We televised the UCLA Bruins and their dominant young center, Lou Alcinder, who later changed his name to Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Jack Twyman offered a report. Lou Alcindor, 7 feet 1 and 3 eighths inches, 230 pounds. Destined to be one of the great players the game of basketball has ever seen. Lucius Allen with the ball over to Warren. They work so well together. A long pass into a beautiful pass by Alcindor. There's a facet of his game we haven't seen. Warren is saying something to Alcindor there. Perhaps we'll see a play. He tips it. He tips it long. Warren's out in front of the pack. That pays it up the Spanning the globe to bring you the constant variety of sport, the thrill of victory, and the agony of defeat. The human drama of athletic competition. This is ABC's Wide World of Sports. In 1967, we took on a new look. 
as our opening went to color for the first time. The late 60s were a time of upheaval in the world, and the sportsman who typified the modern athlete better than any other was still Muhammad Ali. It is extremely important to show you viewers round date, because this is where I believe the real controversy about Ali began. You will see him flagrantly taunt his opponent, vocally, as he belabors him with punches. And I think you were wrong when you said before that all the press is writing about is the foul blows and the foul blows. I don't think they've been unfair to you there. The big question, as far as the press was concerned, was your pitiless taunting of this man. Well, now, how do you defend that? Well, I'll uh, defend that like this, Howie. Uh, I told the press before the fight, I asked, uh, I faced Ernie Terrell as a man, man to man, and uh, I told him that my name is uh, Muhammad Ali in the world, and the people know my name is Muhammad Ali, and this was the approach, and he deliberately insulted me publicly and said my name is Cassius Clay, when it's not so. I told Terrell, I looked the press right into their eyes, and I told them that I would do this. So I don't see why they're so shocked and so surprised. All right, let the public judge uh, as we look at round eight. There I'm saying, what's my name? Which my manager, Herbert Muhammad, criticized me and verbally gave me a good lashing. So I have to apologize here on the show because I was wrong for talking. But I'm sure that he would have rather for me to talk the whole fight than to hit him. And if you tell the truth how on this show, if you defend me like you usually do, you will catch criticism too. And I'll say it for you. I have you never can. defended you. I have never gone against you. Your behavior pattern is portrayed by the American press a very definite issue as it relates to you, your image. I don't see that a man's nothing, privacy of worship is right to his own religion or a man's utilization of due process with regard to his and military it, posture before the government. And I, like to I say, don't see that they're involved. And can, nobody has said they're can involved you box, and the press hasn't said Can you involved. box? All I will say is this. You have your say. If I'm going to be judged by the American press, which are white people, mainly white press, white people, not the Negro, then I think that if I'm going to be judged for talking to a man, then you would be awful, awful guilty if you were judged for the wrong and the things that you are doing every day and have been doing for the 400 years of the so-called Negro in America. But you have a lot of nerve to spend so much millions of dollars in press time and criticizing me for talking. I wish all other people did to people was talk to them. I think what I'm doing now is worse than talking to him. He should be criticizing for whooping him. That's worse than talking. Why make such an itch over talking? That whooping is what you should be mad about. That's what you are mad about, the whooping. You're using the talking for an excuse. One day in our studio, basketball star Will Chamberlain challenged Muhammad to a fight that never happened. Muhammad Ali, the heavyweight champion of the world, at seven feet, one inch, Wilt the still Chamberlain, and what you have just seen was the decisive edge and reach that Wilt would have if these two men do in reality fight. Gentlemen, may I join you for just a minute? I'd like to bring your trainer, Angelo Dundee, in here with your handler, Drew Bodini. Fellas, would you come on in? I'd like you... The reach don't mean nothing if you can't find nothing I here. should like that Angie to nothing. measure it, Not Muhammad. Not reach is longer. But let the viewers see for themselves what the reach would be. Back to back, gentlemen. Just get the pin. Oh, you want to measure Will first? All right, go Sign the contract. Just get the contract. He got the pen out. I got the pen. I got the pen. Basketball players, football players, and co-sales. Right, right, right. What is the reach, Angie? He's the agitator. If he wants to agitate you into a fight, I'll get you. Seven feet. That's right. 91, 92 inches. All right, now measure the champ, will you? And then measure you. Would you, know you just you back off and let them in come trouble. into camera? You don't want to get this man in trouble. May we have your reach, please, Jim? Reach please. don't mean nothing. Terrell had a reach, too. Terrell had a bad jab when the fight started. You couldn't find it. Hurry Wait a minute, Angie. Let, this has been little to me, a world champion foot, yeah. and a basketball player. <laughs> He's 78 inches and a half. 79. And so the edge nothing. is about a foot. That's right. Reach don't about mean a foot. Nothing. David Sluke allowed. Well, why'd you throw your slingshot away? Yeah, slingshot, yeah, slingshot. I, right. I, 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 sure. I have something unseen power that will you. You will oh, admit that his oh, hands unseen. are bigger even than Sonny Liston's were. That don't mean nothing. This man don't have a chance against me. 
Go ahead. Say it again. <laughs> Say it Man, again. Man, you know it better not do. One more time. Well, I'll tell you what. People are writing me mail from all over the country and the world. They believe you can But I want it. you to do some writing. And Bill Russell promises, writing. Bill Russell and a few more players are going to be my sparring partners to get rid of you. And, 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 and they I'll are give, you a, give you a couple of my own. I got a few of my own I'll give you. Well, this, we, 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 huh? Just huh? put your reach out. I, I, what you got in there. I got to see Show them what you got. reach there. This right there. That don't mean nothing. I'll turn. Very easy. Oh, right then Ali yeah. Shuffle. Yeah. And Ali Shuffle will make you Show me Ali Shuffle right now. That's good for shoe shine. That's good for shoe shoe shine. That's nice if <laughs> that's what you're watching. That's nice if that's what you're watching. That's nice. That Ali Watch that one for Gentlemen, you. I must And cut it. that beard off because I'm not fighting Billy Goat. I want to give you a target. From Vienna, we watched as Ludmila Belousova and her husband Oleg Kurapopov dazzle the audience at the World Figure Skating Championship. The finest pair skaters in history, they won gold medals at the 1964 and 1968 Olympic Winter Games. Double overhead, look at the height that she gets. Here's their final pair spin. Look at the style and the position of her, of her figure there. Now stand by for an ovation. The protopopovs of the Soviet Union before this crowd in Vienna. The Yanks against the birds of Baltimore. Mantle at the plate against an old pitching nemesis, Stu Miller. The count, three and two. Mickey the Great, that's what the banner said. And of course, here is Mickey Mantle. And I wonder if you ever felt more gratification at a crowd response than you did at that moment, Mick. Well, I don't think I have. I uh, had a, one of my biggest thrills was last year when I had Mickey Mantle Day, and uh, the crowd gave me uh, almost a, a similar uh, thing. But I think that I, as far as hitting a ball or uh, winning a ball game or anything like that, that's got to be uh, probably one of the biggest thrills I've ever had is the way the fans reacted after it was over with. His name is Francis Chichester, Sir Francis now, a private school dropout at 17, later a miner, a door-to-door -door salesman, a gold prospector, but most of all, a sailor. This week at age 65, he sailed into Plymouth Harbor to complete a solo voyage around the world, 28,500 miles in his 53-foot catch Gypsy Moth Fourth. The route traveled by Chichester took him west to Australia, then across the Pacific, and through the most treacherous waters in the world at Cape Horn, the southern tip of South America, then north through the Atlantic to home. As he reached shore on a motor launch, his wife now at his side, there was a telegram waiting saying simply, welcome home. It was signed by Queen Elizabeth. Nine years ago, this man greeted by 40,000 people had refused an operation for lung cancer and fought it off. Now he had conquered the oceans of the world. Look here, you're talking to somebody who's been alone for four months. Like somebody you bring up from a cave, you know, who's been stuck down there for four months and hasn't seen anybody on this. And you, you, you wouldn't expect me to be um, the slightest bit sort of normal or sane, you see. You must forgive me if I can't answer difficult questions. 
in view of the fact that you look so well, could you do it again? Uh, well, not, not for a week. <laughs> After rounding the horn, Chichester had radioed a message that contained some disappointment and a great deal of wisdom. After something like this, he said, you've made so much effort that success at the end means nothing. It's the effort that counts, not the success. The white flag for A.J. Foyt. He had had two laps to go before, but now all he has to do is negotiate each of these four turns one more time, and it's all over. A.J. Foyt will win his third Indianapolis 500, a great comeback after last year's disappointing season for him. Well, he drove a great race. He just stayed in there all day long. British team, and there's an accident on the front straightaway. There's two, three, four cars. Where's Point? I don't know whether he can get through or not. Another car hitting the wall. Bouncing back across the straightaway. Point's only got a couple hundred yards to go, but where is he? There he is. He's going to get through. A.J. Foyt will win the Indianapolis 500 in an incredible, thrilling finish. Two weeks later, Foyt, the man from Houston, was racing in Europe's great 24 hours of Le Mans for the first time. Racing and winning. Here we're congratulating him with teammate Dan Gurney. It was a brand new world for A.J. Instead of the milk bottle at Indy, it was champagne on the victory stand in France. Jim Ryan is at least 50 yards in front of the second place man. Two turns to go. How strong does that kick look, Jimmy? It doesn't look bad, does it? Jim, it's been strong the whole way, so it's hard to tell. He did accelerate coming around the turn. The entire crowd on its feet as Jim Ryan pounds for home. 20 yards to go. And 10. We get 350.9 on the clock. Well, the official time was 3.51.1. Close to a million dollars worth of motorcycle equipment lined up here in the Mojave Desert for the start of the cross-country motorcycle championship. A Le Mans start. The bikes apart. Engines dead. The flag is up. And here they go. The riders must run about 10 yards to reach their bike. And here the start is most important. Some fire right away, some are a little late. But most of the field is now in motion. And from this view, in our helicopter, with cameraman Nelson Tyler, it looks like a giant ant farm. You'll see them go streaking across this flat portion of the Mojave at high speed, because they have had the opportunity to examine this area of the course, and this only area of the course. The rest of it, they'll be running for the first time. So they'll be going across here at speeds up to 70 miles an hour, and some of the gamblers may go even faster. And here already you begin to see why it is so important to get out in front, because running back in that dust you just simply can't see. And what do you think the desert wildlife thinks about this now? Wow! In Geneva, we watched Peggy Fleming's farewell performance at the World Figure Skating Championships. Carol Heights' 1964 prophecy had come true. Peggy was a gold medal winner at the Grenoble Olympics, and here she was wrapping up her third straight world championship. She was an Olympic champion, the Wide World of Sports Athlete of the Year in 1967, and the Queen of the Ice in the 1960s. Standing lead at the end of the school figures. Peggy Fleming will be the first Olympic skater to win by satellite what could be the best
farewell amateur performance of Peggy Fleming of the United States trying to retain her world championship here in Geneva, Switzerland. We have come to the final moment. Moses Garcia must total 55 points in the final dive in this competition if the Mexican team is to defeat the Americans in the first international meeting here off the cliffs of Acapulco. Uh -huh. Moses Garcia now on the cliff. Moses Garcia, a veteran. He must have six, six, seven. He's got to have a total of 55 points in order for the Mexican team to win this international event. The Americans have done much, much better than many, many people thought they might. They have dueled the Mexicans in their home ground to this final exciting moment, the final dive of the day. The man's name, Moses Garcia. Moses Dive was a winner, and Mexico gained the Cliff Diving Championship. The World Lumberjack Championships were not a made-for-TV sport that disappeared once the cameras left town. This was a sport built on the real labors of America's loggers. And if you measure a sport's legitimacy by the degree of interest and enthusiasm it engenders, this one qualified easily. Bill Fleming called the event. Right now, over in the lagoon section, we have the first of three falls, if they're necessary, in the women's log rolling finals. Charlotte Jenke has won this title three times, and little Cindy Cook has never been in the finals before. So here is truly a story of a veteran against a young newcomer who's only 14. Charlotte, nearest the camera, won this title in 54, 59, and again last year. In this competition, log rolling or burling, the idea is to get that log spinning faster than your opponent can spin with it, then stop it or snub it and make him lose his balance. It takes a lot of concentration. And the first person to go in the water or across that neutral line in the center loses the fall. Now you can maneuver up and down your section as much as you want it. But you can't cross over. You can step on the middle line, but you can't cross over. Oh, Charlotte's in trouble. There's quite a surprise. We continue with the finals of the Duke Kahanamoku Surf Classic. This is Jock Sutherland coming off the lip of a massive wave. And he gets great speed coming down the face of the wave and streaks across the face. Look at the speed that Jock Sutherland's been able to get. His surface bumpy, uneven, kind of like a rough ski trail, and Sutherland is wiped out. You see the, the hole in the water literally seemed to jerk that board out from underneath him. But here is Fred Hemmings Jr. again. That search for the wave, he's up, he's up, and he is on his way. Fred Hemmings Jr. who has surfed these waves since he was a boy, 185 pound man dropping down the face, picking up the speed. Jock Sutherland at the left, and Rick Gregg at the right, They've got a whopper. This is maybe one of the best waves of the day. Look at the fantastic power of this great wave as it sends Jock Sutherland plummeting into the air goes the board that had the appearance of a kick out by Sutherland. Mario Andretti was out for practice in a Lotus, one of the cars prepared and designed by Colin Chapman. A beautiful looking thing as Clint Broder watched Suddenly, there was a crash. It looked like real disaster for Mario Andretti. And of course, Art Pollard was right behind there in a very dangerous situation. Well, here it is again, Roger. Into the wall, the nose flew off completely, wheels off. And you can see Mario jumping out almost before the car is stopped. I feel fine. Ready to go with the other car. This is the scene in the closing moments. The white flag, one lap for Mario Andretti. And Andy Granatelli can hardly stand it. Finally slipping on his red victory jacket. He still won't talk to anybody. And the crowd beginning to pay its tribute to Andretti. The young man who came to this country at the age of 14 as an immigrant from Italy. He had driven racing cars even before he came over here. This was the one he wanted more than anything else in the world. And here it comes, Mario. 
the checkered flag of victory. He's done it. And here is Victory Lane. What a cherished place that is here in Indiana. It certainly is, and you got to know that at this moment he still doesn't believe it. The wreath of victory coming in. The Borg Warner trophy, emblematic of victory behind him, that huge trophy. The traditional sip of milk. No champagne here at Indianapolis, it's milk. And now, for the first time in history, the winning driver has been kissed first, not by the beauty queen, but by the winning owner. Today, these volunteer firemen are on a vacation. A fireman's vacation, if you will, somewhat like a busman's holiday. They've gathered in Syracuse, New York, to engage each other in the friendly forms of various firefighting techniques with equipment used strictly for competition. It's all in fun, but with a serious purpose behind it. And he's off. Now jamming on the brakes, the ladder goes down, good position, up goes the climber. And he touches at 11.31 seconds for the Islip Wolves. All right, the course is clear and they're off. Oh, they're never going to make it. Too much speed and down they go. This is also four men on the back. You can use up to nine. Some teams use three on the back, some four, some five. Have to hurry. Having a little trouble and the nozzle go. <laughs> Time to beat, 29-14. The lifter here is Bill Murray, a cab driver. And the man topside, the dumper, is Harry Penny. <laughs> Getting close. That's it. 24-67, a good time by the Bayshore Redskins. Residential area of Honolulu on the green slopes. As the rain has stopped, the sun peeking through occasionally, the North scoring its second touchdown after 10 seconds of the fourth quarter. And they now kick to the south. 13 to nothing. Art Toms boots the ball. O.J. Simpson at the 16, 20. Look out! O.J. When it gets to be a foot race, 84 yards, ladies and gentlemen. And the South has <laughs> with O.J. Wasn't that beautiful? Is there ever a man more alive, more in love with the triumph of talent, determination, and personal discipline than Vince Lombardi? He was professional football's greatest coach at the peak of his powers as he took over the Washington Redskins. Uh, I want to say that I'm very, very happy that I, that I am back. I, I knew I missed football, but I don't think I realized how much I missed it until I, I, I got back into it this year. What was it you told me when you took the job? I was tired of being a myth. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I wanted to dispel that out if I could. I don't feel I'm a myth. I don't feel I'm any, you know, that I'm any different than anybody else, really. So maybe I will dispel it. <laughs> now, a lot of the press have been here already, of course, because of your past renown. And they're beginning to talk all over again and write all over again about the Martinet and the dictator and the man who, in truth, can be a heel, cruel, brutal, and so on. You chuckled as I said it, but you know that this kind of criticism exists. I know it does, Howard, and I thought that was one of the reasons, I think, that uh, caused my, 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 my retirement for a year, really, was that, was that kind of talk, really. I think that had a great deal to do with it. But it's back again, and I, uh, I just don't understand why, but it's not gonna, I'm not going to let it bother me this time, really. Because there's really, there's very, very, very little truth in it. I, I would say, if any truth in it, I think if you speak to anybody, any of the players, I think they'll say that they'll dispel that. I think almost immediately. But why do you hate Lombardi? <laughs> I don't hate Lombardi. I love him. Sam Huff loved the flat-out honesty of Lombardi, his directness, whether laughing or chewing out a lazy player. In a day of chilly cynicism, one had to admire a man who said what he thought, lived what he believed, and died his untimely death in courageous dignity. ABC's Wide World of Sports has been blessed throughout its existence by the dignity and courage of its athletes. 
whether it was Vince Lombardi or Valerie Brumel, Peggy Fleming or Arnold Palmer. Certainly we introduced technical innovations that today have become routine, but what we're proudest of always is the athletes. We knew from the beginning that we'd be showing sports to people who didn't know or care about many of the events, so we focused on the individual. Now all of sports television introduces you to the athlete, but we're proud that we were the first to take you up close and personal. I hope you've enjoyed this look back at Wide World of Sports in the 60s, but don't forget all the excitement and achievements of the 70s and the 80s are also available on video cassette. It's a special package that traces the history of this trailblazing series and is sure to become a collector's item. Don't miss it. Thanks for watching this one. I'm Jim McKay, and I hope that I'll see you soon somewhere in this wide world of sports.